Right, uh, do you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, Stephen, for inviting me, and thank you very much for coming here. I guess you're all very, very tired, and, but it's good to see you here. So uh, what I'm going to do in this lecture is to talk about uh, uh, the, the title of the transition to experiencing, and I'm using the, uh, the term experiencing in the same way that Stephen is using the term feeling. I will not go into the justification of the term. I just want us to have a common ground so you understand what I'm talking about. And as you, say, as you, see, you see here, four trilobites. It's uh, extinct animals that were around in the late Cumbrian. And there they are. All have nice eyes and all are sort of looking with interest at the little worms that they're about to eat. And down there, you see a quotation from Herbert Spencer who thought quite deeply about the question of the evolution of psychological traits and the, the evolution, the, the, the emergence of what he called mind. Mind can be understood only by showing how mind is evolved. And I think that he had a point. So here are the people involved in this, all in, uh, in situ most of them in situations which show that they do have consciousness. <laughs> yeah. Okay, these are my, my colleagues and... Uh, with, with whom I have been discussing these ideas quite a lot. So what, the kind, what, what does it mean to approach a problem from evolutionary point of view? There are many ways in which you can use evolution. And I'm talking about uh, a, a, an approach to answering evolutionary problems or uh, uh, addressing evolutionary problems, which is called the evolutionary transition approach. So John Maynard Smith and Ernst Sartmary wrote a book, an influential book in 1995, called uh, major, evolution, uh, major Transitions in Evolution. And they identified a number of transitions uh, which were characterized by the way that information was stored, uh, was stored and utilized mainly. The kind of transition that I have in mind are transitions into new teleological systems. And this happened, I think, in a big way, only three times in the history of life. The first transition was the transition to life, the second transition was the transition to experiencing, and the third transition was the transition to symbolizing. And in all three transitions, something very significant, very different happened. In the first transition to life, a new system, a living system, had emerged, and this system had, was goal-directed, and its goal was to survive and to reproduce, so to speak. And the measure of this is fitness. The second transition, which interests us here, the transition to experiencing, is uh, characterized by its being a transition to a new, where the, a new telos, a new goal has arisen, and this goal is defined by the felt needs of the organism. The organism does things because it is hungry, because it is painful, because of all kinds of feelings, experiences that it has. Of course, it has to be underlined, uh, underlined by fitness considerations, but fitness is something that underlies everything in the living world. But on top of this, superimposed on considerations of fitness are goals, felt, felt motives, felt desires that are moving the organism. And at the higher level, it is all kinds of values like the beautiful, the just, the good, and so on, which are special to us. I will talk about the second transition, the transition to experiencing. So why is it useful to think in the terms of a transitional effect? When we're thinking about a transition, we're looking at an organism, at the that we're we are saying that the type of organism that, you, that appears immediately after the transition, and I, I will qualify this, because the transition is not a point, it is a spectrum. But nevertheless, the, the organisms about which we say, this one has this trait, this one is alive, this one is experiencing, would be the simplest of its type. And therefore, the many derived associations and dissociations that occur in evolution would not mask our vision of what is most fundamental about the kind of organization that is instantiating having this kind of telos, this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of trait, being alive, feeling, having, having abstract values. So, 
This will allow us to recognize the most fundamental organizational principles that constitute, in our case, experience. The second point is that if we take an evolutionary transition framework, we can point to useful analogies to other transitions. Because as I said, the transition to experiencing is not the only teleological transition. There are two more. The transition to life and the transition to, uh, to rationality, symbolizing, and so on. So we can learn from them, maybe, we hope. And then, if, we can be, if we're able to advance a little bit in the way that we understand and answer these questions, we can change the framing of philosophical questions about consciousness and suggest answers to the distribution question. The distribution question is, who has it? Who is experiencing in the living world, and who is it? The big problem here, and this is not a problem that we, and this is very, very acute when we're talking about this kind of transition, is how do we identify the simplest experiencing system if it is very different from that of humans, mammals? What are our criteria? This is the big question, the most difficult question. So, how do we answer, how do we approach this, uh, this kind of problem? And we don't start with saying what are the neural correlates of consciousness because this is the end of the, uh, the road, not the beginning. So we have to start somewhere else. So where do we start? How do we start? And here I'm basing my suggestion on what we have learned about the transition to life and I will go through it very briefly later, uh, soon. So first of all, we are looking at lists of characteristics and criteria that are generally agreed that these are the characteristic and criteria that characterize the kind of thing that we have in mind. What is it about? What is life? What is experience? We don't have to have a definition. We will not have a definition. But we can have a set of conditions and criteria which are widely acceptable. Then we can look at models that, uh, of dynamic models, of uh, dynamic organization models that instantiate this type of characteristics and criteria. This would be great if we can find them. Then we shall have, since we are evolutionary biologists, we ask what are the evolutionary scenarios? When, where, and how did the process happen? For example, under what conditions did life evolve? Under what conditions did experiencing evolve? Did it emerge once? Did it emerge many times? Was it lost during <laughs> evolution? Where, why, when? These are the kind of questions that we ask in evolutionary biology. Another thing that we want to do is to identify a complexity threshold. Because we're talking about evolution, inevitably there will be big gray areas where we don't know how to define a system. Is it alive? Is it not alive? It has part of the properties, it doesn't have all of them, it answers some of them. So at some point we have to say, well, if you have this, if this is the complexity, if, if, if it has this level of complexity, then we're there. The complexity the threshold is not an identification. It's an indicator. It's an indicator that tells us you're there. All right? And the, third, and the last thing is that we want to identify clearly the new telos that, that is characterizing this mode of being. Okay, so I want to look at the, very briefly at the success story. The success story is the transition to living. And when I'm saying that it's a success story, it's not because we know how to synthesize life in the laboratory. We do not. But what, what we do know is we do know to think about the problem. And when I'm saying that we have lists and we have organizational principles and scenarios and complexity thresholds and you tell us, I'm not going to go through them in a, the order I'm going through them doesn't mean that this is how one should go about them. We are very pragmatic. We, find, we advance a little bit on one, uh, in one domain and then we use another one. So the order is not important. But these are the things we want to address. Okay. So let's look at life. And I'm going to, and I'm going to go through it very, very quickly. People have been trying to define the characteristic and criteria for life for a long time. And certainly from the beginning of the 19th century, we have very systematic uh, attempts to do it. I will not go through them. There are hundreds of them, literally. But I want to give you just some of them. So, for example, De Duve, a very well-known biochemist, uh, said that life is characterized by 
it maintains itself in, far, in a state far from equilibrium, grow and multiply. He's looking at life from a metabolic point of view. Orgel gives a, a list of four criteria. One of them is that, it is, uh, that uh, the organization is such that it is highly unlikely to have arisen spontaneously, that it's a product of natural selection, that it requires the replication of some kind of material. It's not necessarily DNA, but something and that the information is stored in stable st uh, chemical structures. And uh, Margaret Bowden, artificial uh, intelligence person, is saying that life has to be uh, characterized by self-organization, autonomy, emergence, development, adaptation, responsiveness, evolution, reproduction, growth, metabolism. And there are uh, overlaps between, this uh, between these characteristics, and if you're looking at uh, the vast literature about life and the definitions of life and characteristics of life, you will see that there are very many of those, and they are partially, and they sort of converge to a list that will be acceptable for most people. Now, the point about it, now, what we need now is some kind, if we can, find some kind of model, some kind of dynamic model, that will actually instantiate this property so that when we see the model, we will say, yes, this type of system ha is self-organizing, autonomous, has emergent properties, has development, adaptation, and so on and so forth. All right? Now, there were many, many people who were thinking about it in the early 1970s. Again, uh, there were two uh, very important contributions to thinking about the field. One was by Varela and Maturana, and they, were, and they defined something which is called an autopoietic system. It was defi uh, they defined it in 1972, and they said that an autopoietic system is organized as a network of processes of production, synthesis and uh, destruction of, uh, of components, such that these components continuously regenerate and realize the network that produces them, and to constitute the system as a distinguishable unit in the domain in which they exist. This is a quotation from Varela. Now, they did more than they give this kind of abstract definition. They actually built models that showed how this kind of thing could work. At the same time, a Hungarian or, uh, organic chemist, very unwell known, uh, uh, called Tibor Ganti, developed a model which he called Chemoton of uh, minimal life. And this model, the Chemoton, again, I will not go into it, it is an actual, he, he's, he's an organic chemi chemist, so he's using his knowledge of chemistry. He's, def he's, de uh, def uh, he's describing a model where, you have, uh, where a system has three properties. It has a metabolic engine, which takes elements from the outside, converts them into elements in the inside, we, and these elements then are used to build up three, three uh, tightly coupled systems a membrane system, which gives closure to the system, and also some selectivity, and a polymer <coughs> that has information about the system as a whole. If you will want, I will talk about this model uh, in the discussion. But there is a model like that, and this model instantiates many, many of the properties, and Gante wrote a whole book showing how this very, very simple model instantiates all the properties of life that we recognize. Right? So I'm just telling you in advance, we don't have, uh, unfortunately yet, the equivalent of the chemoton in consciousness studies. We don't. But we may get there. Right, then there are scenarios. Again, the evolution of life, when you're thinking about how life first evolved, it very much depends on how you think it evolved. Was it metabolism first? Was it replication first? Was it membranes first? How did it happen? So there are many, many, many different scenarios. Again, I will not go through the many scenarios. Here I gave just three. One is Oparin in, in 1924 in the USSR, and he was talking about metabolism first and trying to use his great knowledge of uh, biochemistry of the time in order to imagine how a system, a self-reproducing system with some variation, which is amenable to some modest natural selection, can evolve. Holden was thinking about a virus-like particle, uh, which was using uh, a self-replicating kind of entity, which was using the, uh, uh, the materials in the hot little pond of ancient life. 
and there is a guy called Wechterhauser, which has a very elaborate and very beautiful model. I'm just mentioning him because it's, I'm not going to go into the model. It's just a very, very different model, and he, he, he's envisaging very different conditions, not of the hot little pond, but uh, very hot, uh, in, fa in fact, volcanic vents in the deep sea, 100, uh, 100 degrees, and all kinds of very interesting processes that go there and create the, f the first self-sustaining variable unit that can be the precursor of life. Now, what is the complexity threshold? So, so we have these things. Now, how do we know? Let's say that we start with a, an idea like that of the virus, and we're saying, well, you know, maybe a virus where you, hope, you have all the other elements there in the environment which are feeding into it is a living creature. But if you, or we're thinking about small RNAs, how small? I mean, if you have a self-reproducing system of only four nucleotides, is it alive? All our intuitions scream no. But as scientists, we have to do better than just rely on intuitions. We have to have reasons, right? So, or at least good ideas so that, that con will convince everybody. So one of the things that we, so my, again, John Maynard Smith and Sat Murray suggested in their book, The Major Transitions uh, in Evolution, that the complexity threshold for life is something they called limit, unlimited heredity. That when a system has something that they called unlimited heredity, then we can say this system is alive. Now, what is unlimited heredity and what is limited heredity? They defined it, so this is a great help. And limited heredity is a heredity system where the number of possible hereditary variants in the system is small and therefore evolutionary change is extremely limited. So if we have four uh, bases, yes, and we can have them in all kinds of orders, we don't have very many possibilities. The number of possible environments is far, far larger than the number of possible variations. In unlimited heredity, the, nu the number of hereditary variations is practically unlimited and evolution is therefore open-ended. Now, Practically unlimited doesn't mean that it's really unlimited. It's not infinite. It's just very, very big. That's all. That's enough. It's much bigger than the number of possible environments in which the, in which the thing can be. And what is very interesting, and they didn't talk about it, but it, was a, but it sort of was, if you read it carefully, you see that it is in the end assumed, is that when you have a system of unlimited heredity, it presupposes that it is part of an autopoietic system. So your criterion presupposes something about the organization. Right. What is the new telos that has arisen with the evolution of life? Well, function. Function appeared. Before we had life or something that was, was on the road to life in the gray area, we couldn't talk about parts of a, thing, of a system having a function. And, or having functional information. Functional information is any difference that makes a difference to the goal-directed self-sustaining behavior of a system. This kind of thing didn't exist before life had emerged. So once life had emerged, some, well, once life was there, suddenly we could talk about goal-directed system and about functions, something that doesn't have very much meaning in other, uh, unless we're talking about man-made artifacts. Of course, then we can do it. But in physics, we're not talking about function. What is the function of the solar system? So functional information, I say, emerged and evolved. It was an emergent property of some proto-living complex self-stabilizing systems, and it blossomed into a necessary and exuberant existence with the origin of life. It was there a little bit before, because we're already there in some kind of primitive self-sustaining system, but that's when we started having functions, lots and lots of functions. Okay, and it is this problem of function, by the way, and of goal-directedness that was so difficult for pre-20th century by, uh, philosophers and biologists to understand. Kant devoted the second part of his third critique of judgment to the problem of life, of what is it? Why can't we crack this? What? On the one hand, he, he said, we, we only have mechanistic explanation. On the other hand, he said, we need to, to use teleological reasoning. There is some kind of gap. He couldn't, he couldn't cross it. This was the big problem. And that's why a lot of people did think 
that in order to understand life, you have to add something. And unlike what Chalmers has said, that Vitalis didn't have this problem, I suggest that you read, read what Nehemia grew, a very famous uh, uh, se- late 17th century botanist, have written. When you read it, you have a deja vu. Is it Chalmers or is it Gru? Exactly the same reasoning. Okay, so these are the kind of things that when we're thinking about life, we're thinking, uh, we're thinking in these terms. And I want now to use this kind of heuristics in order to start analyzing the transition to experiencing. So what do I want to do? I want to give you a list of something that would be more or less agreeable, that this are indeed a list that characterizes an experiencing system. I want to suggest a complexity threshold, which I hope would be reasonable. It's not a definition. I want to say something about the instantiating dynamics, where, where we are not there, absolutely not there, but we, it may, what we, we, can, we are making some advances. I want to suggest an evolutionary scenario and identify the new telos, account for the phenomenal aspect. It's not uh, uh, very megalomanic. Yeah? I'm very sorry, but you know, here we are asked to talk about the evolution of consciousness and feeling. So what can we do? It's a big question. Right, so what is the list of characteristics that we more or less would agree with? And I, uh, we accumulated it for, from a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, from a lot of uh, different uh, uh, psycholo- uh, psychologists, philosophers, uh, neuroscientists. So a system that is experiencing would need to have ontological objectivity, embodiment, a sense of self, of ownership, situatedness vis-à-vis the world, transparency, intentionality, referral, aboutness, temporal thickness, qualia that have unity and diversity, and causal efficacy. So that, yeah? I think this is a very demanding list. I think it, it's, a, it's a merge of uh, Searle and Dennett and Metzinger and, you know, the lot. Mostly philosophers, but not only philosophers. So now what we want to do is to, to, to think about scenarios and dynamics and complexity threshold that together somehow instantiate these features and then give us a feeling uh, and understanding of what, what is a telos that is characterized by fir, fir, uh, first-person ontology. So we begin with a complexity threshold because in a way it is the easiest. <laughs> although it may sound counterintuitive. It is the easiest because we do not have the dynamics. We cannot have the evolution before we have this. And so we start there. So again, I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about a definition. I'm talking about an indicator that tells me when you're there, when the system is there, it is experiencing. So we want to suggest, and the rest of the talk will be an attempt to justify this, uh, that experiencing emerged with the evolution of neural centralization and flexible, which I call unlimited, following just because of <coughs> Satmar and Maynard Smith, associative learning, which I call UAL, unlimited associative learning. It is, of course, limited. Yes, it's just very flexible in animals. UAL enabled animals to learn new relations on the basis of their ontogeny, ontogenetic history, and they entailed new functions which altered their evolutionary trajectories. And we highlight three major functions of experiencing UAL, discrimination, prediction, and motivation. We argue that the integrated sensory states that are generated during UAL act as internal guides and selectors of new neural relations, new behaviors, and new ends. They lead to unitary, subjective, and intentional internal dynamic states. This is the argument. The rest of the talk is trying to justify it. Okay? Now, if you have UAL, just as you have unlimited heredity, this presupposes a lot about the system. And in our case, it presupposes a certain, a certain neural organization, cephalization, and other things. But I'll, go, I'll get there. Okay, so let us, first of all, just to make this point very clear, make a comparison between the limited and unlimited heredity and limited and unlimited learning that I'm talking about. So we say... Uh, we have the limited heredity, the number of possible heredity variants in the system is small and therefore evolutionary change is extremely limited. 
Limited learning, the number of relations that can be formed and recalled is small. Most learning is non-associative. Okay, limited heredity, a lot, a lot of variants. Many, many more than the, kind, than the number of environments in which the creature can inhabit. Unlimited no, uh, learning, the number of associations that can be formed and recalled within and between modalities is vast. Although, yes, there are many, many constraints. Yeah? Not everything can be associated with everything, but there are a vast number of associations that can be formed within the constraints of the system. Sensory categorization is both rich and persistent. So, I'm going to talk about learning and I want us to have common ground, so I want to define what I'm talking about. What is learning? Learning, I say, we say, has occurred when one or more input starts a reaction that leads to a response. The input-response relation is memorized. By memorized, we mean that some physical traces, known as engrams, of the reaction persist. The threshold for responding to the input has changed. This memorized relation, then, can be recalled upon later exposure to the same or similar input conditions. The effect, the functional reaction or behavior, appears more readily or with less exposure to the input. We have changed the threshold of reaction. That's all. Now, when does associative learning, which is a special case of learning, happens? It happens when there are several different inputs occurring simultaneously or sequentially that lead to corresponding reaction or reactions to a response. And the chemical or anatomical relation among the reaction's internal effects are formed and persist as engrams, and one or few of the original, of the original input can elicit the response. Not all of them, just one or few of them. Okay? Now, when we're thinking about learning, we have to understand that this is not something that is uh, specific to uh, creatures with nervous systems. We have something <laughs> like very simple learning also in unicellular organisms. In fact, I believe that all the cells in our body, certainly in our brains, have very nice epigenetic learning mechanisms. This is a little model showing learning by sensitization of a, a, of a gene. What we have here is we have a stimulus as a result of the, the chromatin of this uh, uh, control region is changed, and as a result of that, there is transcription and there is a phenotype. Now, what happens is that this change at the chromatin level persists, persists between generations, and therefore the stimulus appears again and again and again, even when there is no stimulus, external stimulus given. This is not learning, right? The upper thing is epigenetic inheritance, but it's not learning. Learning is a, is a more clever thing. We have the stimulus, the stimulus elicits the chromatin change and the response, and then some of the engrams disappear, right? So we don't have three pluses there, which are, in, uh, which, which are remembered, but only, two, but only three. However, when the same stimulus or a smaller stimulus occurs, the reaction is faster. So here we have learning based sensitization in cells, and we have, at, at the moment, some evidence from, uh, from, uh, from studying epigenetic systems that such things exist. And they are not just a figment of my imagination. So when we're, thinking about, when we're thinking about learning, we're not thinking necessarily, we can, we're thinking about cells, we're thinking about several levels of organization. This is one. And we know that the paramecium that you see up there is a high, very interesting and learning creature, probably even has very limited associative learning. If you will want, I will show you a model of it later. Now, when we're thinking about plants, unfortunately we didn't all hear the plant talk this morning. Plants are extremely sophisticated systems, uh, organisms, there are lots of adaptive behaviors there. We have the mimosa, we have the orsea, we have all kinds of, of plants, we have plant communication. There's a wonderful book coming out by Daniel Chaimovich, just coming up, so, coming, coming up soon, uh, What a Plant Knows, which tells you all the wonders of the plant world. So we can have a lot of adaptive behavior and a lot of simple learning in plants, in creatures without a nervous system. Now, what happened, however, what is important, at some point in evolution, in the history of life, something very, very important happened. Creatures, some creatures, acquired a nervous system. It was a huge change in the mode of existence 
of this creatures, the animals. And what they did, we're talking about multicellular organisms. The multicellular organism became integrated through a dedicated network. And this kind of nerve nets, and we see them in creatures like the cnidaria, like the medusa, the hydra, or the, and also ctenophora, the sea lilies. Now, in, they appeared in these diploblastic animals, and they, the, the nervous system is a new way of transmitting information and integrating the organisms. The specificity and speed of information transfer was very much greater than, uh, than, what, we, than what we see in, uh, in, any, uh, in, in non-neural organisms. Okay, now, when we're, thinking, when we're looking at, le at learning in Cnidaria, in this kind of organisms, what we see is that they have limited, limited associative learning, if at all. They have learning, they, they, have, limited, uh, they, they have limited learning. They have a, a, a lot of learning by sensitization and habituation. I found one uh, paper that showed that there is some associative learning there, but if there is, it's very, very limited. What they do have is a lot of processes of exploration and selective stabilization, and those of you who heard here Bjorn Brems know what it's all about. It's these uh, movements that are stabilized by reinfor through reinforcement, random kind of stochastic movements, uh, and uh, all kinds of different types of exploration which are stabilized by positive reinforcement or by uh, negative reinforcement that leads away from the stimulus. So the other thing, since I don't have much time, I will be very short about this. The one thing that we have to remember is that when we're looking at this kind of animal, imagine an animal with a lot of sensors, with a lot of effectors, with everything connected to everything else. This is like a huge net inside the organism. And the organism is responding to the environment. And there is a kind of existential buzz in this organism, if you want. There are all kinds of sensory, uh, sensory noise going on. I'm not saying this is experiencing. I do think it is a necessary condition for experiencing. And this kind of thing has been thought about, by the way, I will not go into it, by one of the greatest uh, biologists that we had by uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And Lamarck, in... Uh, this third book of the Philosophie Zoologique has uh, thought that this kind of existential buzz is the basis of the mental state. But again, okay. Now, what do I think about what do we think about uh, unlimited associative learning? First of all, we think that it appeared, as I said, it entails a certain organization. It cannot appear. In a, creature that, in a creature that does not have a, a, a centralized brain, we think. So what we think is that once a single forward direction of locomotion was defined, the anterior part of animals became the first to meet or seek various stimuli in the environment. And uh, this resulted in the concentration of sensory cells in the front end of the animal, its head, and other neural elements along the body. Close interactions among different sensory and motor regions, subserving different sensors and motor system, allowed binding and integration of sensory inputs from different modalities and coordination of motor out outputs. Strong selection for neural differentiation and more efficient lateral inhibitions to reduce increased noise, which was the result of bringing together all this load of neurons. Selection for stabilization of the world image and the body image. And Merkel, thankfully, talked a lot about it here. So, uh, and uh, there was differentiation between self-generated and non-self-generated stimuli. Again, Merkel told you a lot about that, so I'll not go into it, and so did Brems. Now, what happened was that when sensors fired together, there was by, and, and the organization was such that sensors that there were sensory organs, and sensory organs got a lot of input all together, and these inputs were, were uh, got together to the animal, there was binding, and binding was selected for long term, uh, uh, and, and binding selected, this binding selected for long term memory of neural association. And this associative memory was, was selected because it led, first of all, to discrimination, because the thing is both round and, let's say, yellow. Okay, or round and buzzy, 
or, or that moves quickly, and so on. So you can discriminate a lot more things. But the moment you can discriminate, one feature of the, uh, uh, of the thing can sort of, and if these things are remembered, if there's selection for memory, one feature of the thing sort of presupposes the other feature. So we can have already associative memory here, even if things happen not one after the other, as they do in Pavlovian and instrumental learning, but together. Just this, this is also a form, very simple, very elementary form, that allows for associations to be formed. Now, this led to the ability to discriminate, to predict, and also it allowed, uh, it led to motivation, because what was remembered was not only what is happening at the moment, I mean, wh when, when we get the stimulus, we respond, the response takes time. If the, response that take, if the response takes time and there are memory traces of the response as it happens, then when we elicit the response again, this elicitation of the trajectory towards action is what, is what we call the basis of motivation. Okay. So what we're suggesting is that unlimited associative le learning and experiencing were evolutionarily isomorphic. So the point is, is it's not that experiencing is added to associative learning. What it means is that it is a facet of associative learning. You cannot have a creature with unlimited associative learning as it evolves when the creature evolves, it also necessarily has experiencing because experiencing is the kind of organization that allows for it. It is the kind of global sensory categorization that we recognize as experiencing. So what we think is that evolutionarily these things were totally coupled Ontogenetically, in extant animals, there can be experiencing without unlimited associative learning. But there is no unlimited associative learning without experiencing, we say. Unlimited, I'm not talking about priming and about blindsight. I'm talking about exploratory, creative, associative learning. And evolutionarily, we claim they, they emerge together. Okay. So... We called, so here we have a little model, I don't have much time, but just want to go through it. It's based on James. And what we see here is one, two, three, is first, everything is built on a reflex initially, right? It can't be built on anything else. The reflex can be very rigid, the, reflex, reflex, the sensory input can lead to exploratory behavior. It doesn't matter from our point of view, but it's based on something that is there when the, when the, uh, when the animal is born. So we have a sensory input, then we have an integrated sensor, uh, nervous system that sends this input to the motor, uh, to the body. From the body it comes back to the integrating brain, and this is what experience is, right? There are also relationships between bits of the brain. Of course, it's not the only thing that happens. There are bits of the brain that are talking to each other, which we didn't show. Now, in the, uh, now, all this is happening, but as all this is happening in the real world, in the here and now, not in our models, right? There are also lots of other things happening. There is a context. The bear has ears. It is brown. It is smelling like this. Lots and lots of things are correlated. When we have the body response, it's also happening in context. So all these things are happening, so what, what, we are ex what, what is happening is that the reflex is the scaffold on which we build our experience. Our experience is not, is not it, 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 we need this scaffold because we have to build on something, and the something is this basic reflex that we, with, that we come to the world with, which we can afterwards kick out. They may not be necessary after we experience for this first time. And this is what James said. He said, it is obvious that every instinctive act in an animal with memory must cease to be blind after being once repeated and must be accompanied with the faucet of its end just so far as that end may have fallen under the animal's cognizance. Right. I don't have time to develop all this since I don't have time, right? 
<laughs> what I want to say is that there are three major functions to, to unlimited associative learning and to the experience that it entails. You know, in the, it is just that it's, 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 it's be, having unlimited associative learning, it means having experiencing because it does, you cannot have the sensory categorization without it, not in an animal. Maybe you can have it in a robot, I don't know. But you cannot have it in a, in, in a biological evolving animal. So we're saying there are three things. One is discrimination, the second one is prediction, and the third one is telling the animal clues what to do, motivation. So we argue that experiencing phenomenal consciousness is an overall integrated, persistent, embodied, categorizing sensory state that has evolved as a facet of associative learning. Its function is to categorize inputs and outputs to motivate the animal and allow predictions on the basis of partial cues that construct sensory motor categories. The complexity threshold is the ability for flexible and limited associative learning. And we suggest that this, the beginning of this of the evolution of this uh, unlimited associative learning and with it uh, phenomenal consciousness began in the Cambrian. There is a huge gray area and the gray area exists is as huge as it is because we don't have a good dynamic model as yet. We heard here a lecture about aplesia. Does aplesia have consciousness? I don't think so but I'm not sure and I will not be sure un until that such time that I have a good dynamic model. But I, ha I know what a dynamic model must have. What are the ingredients? I don't know how to build it. So it has to have exploration and selective stabilization at several different levels of organization, from the intracellular to the level of behavior itself, trial and error behavior. It has to have reentrant and feedback interactions, sensory binding through temporal synchronization, and a global kind of state. We have to have value system. There must be hierarchical mapping and there must be embodiment. There must be compensatory mechanism leading to coherence and stability of world and body image. It has to have extended present because it takes time for us to feel things. So things must take time in the, at, at the temporal dimension. And we have to have unlimited associative learning. If we will be able to put these things together in a model, in a way that makes sense and that couples them, in a way that is biologically valid, that is biologically, that biologically makes sense, I think will be, will make a big, big advance. Now, who has it and when did it first appear? We see that associative learning appears in the Cambrian from the distribution of the animals that do have it. So we assume that it is very ancient. We think that, in fact, we think that associative learning was one of the things that drove the Cambrian explosion. It is a new way of living. It's a new way of uh, suddenly you have uh, goals that uh, you can learn ontogenetically, not just phylogenetically. So it's a big thing. It's a huge thing. And we think that it, and we wrote a paper about it, about why we think that it was really one of the important driving forces in the Cambrian explosion. This kind of, uh, uh, this kind of thinking also has uh, some predictions and uh, we're doing at the moment some bioinformatics work in order to check it and I'm glad to say that we have some positive <laughs> preliminary result but I, I'm not sure we didn't finish the analysis. So, and there is a, a, a new telos, felt needs. This is what, these this are the things that begin to drive creatures like that. And all the things that, all the list that I have uh, given you in the beginning, all these features are instantiated by this categorizing sensory states, uh, categorizing sensory states that are global embodied sensory categories. And that's it. Thank you.